Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in for this talk on the Breast Cancer Index, a biomarker for extended endocrine therapy benefit. My name is Elizabeth Ott. I am a physician assistant in breast medical oncology at the West Cancer Center. For those of you who don't practice in the breast cancer space, I thought I would give you just a brief overview of the subtypes to give you a little bit of context. Uh, there are three main subtypes that we talk about with breast cancer, triple negative, HER2 positive, and hormone receptor positive, which you'll also hear called ER positive sometimes. <clears throat> triple negatives are fairly aggressive and typically require chemotherapy plus or minus immunotherapy. Likewise, HER2 positive breast cancers are also aggressive and they typically require HER2 targeted therapy, which often involves chemotherapy. ER positive breast cancers are a little bit different. They are more slow growing and they can receive chemotherapy in some settings, but the mainstay of treatment for these patients is endocrine therapy, which attacks the estrogen uh, driven process for increasing the metabolism of these cancers. Typically this endocrine therapy, which is an oral medication, uh, is taken for five to 10 years. For higher risk stage three patients, they can even go up to 15 years, but for the purposes of our talk today, we will be discussing early stage patients. While early stage ER positive breast patients do have a good overall prognosis, for the patients that do end up having recurrence, over 50% of these actually occur after the five year mark. Just to put that in perspective, for a triple negative patient, that highest risk of recurrence is within the first two years. So this is a, a rather different process that we see. You'll also remember that we talked about these patients being on their endocrine therapy for five to 10 years. So for early stage patients who were getting five years of therapy as planned, obviously if you're, they're recurring after that five year mark, that brought up some questions about would more medicine be better? There were several trials that looked at whether or not an additional uh, five years of endocrine therapy would be beneficial for these patients. And they all showed consistent results of about three to 5% absolute benefit from that extra five years of therapy. What they didn't tell us, however, is which of these patients is most likely to get benefit from that further therapy. Now it'd be easy to, and convenient to say that all patients should get another five years of therapy to get that extra 5% benefit. But unfortunately, these medications are not always easily tolerated. There's about a 10% chance of adverse event with either bone to toxicity, such as osteoporosis, um, thromboembolic events, and even endometrial cancers. Also, these are not easy medications for people to tolerate. Um, about 50% of patients have tolerability challenges, which I think is a conservative number. Uh, hot flashes, joint pains, vaginal issues, and many other problems uh, can make these medications quite difficult to tolerate for five years in the first place, let alone 10 years. Traditionally, we would use clinicopathologic factors to help determine which patients should get more therapy, such as tumor size and grade and patient age. But these are helpful for prognostic indicators, but they don't actually help predict which patients get benefit from further therapy. It's helpful to uh, know the difference between prognostic and predictive factors in this setting. So prognostic factors help correlate with outcome, meaning that a patient with higher risk features typically has a poorer outcome, whereas predictive factors help us determine whether or not a patient's specific tumor would be uh, more likely to receive benefit from a specific intervention, in this case, extended endocrine therapy, which is where the breast cancer index comes in. So this is a genomic assay, which is performed on the original primary breast tumor. This is essentially two tests in one. It's a predictive test as well as a prognostic test. Both of these are based on uh, the HI biomarker as well as an algorithm of that HI biomarker with several other genes. The predictive value gives us a high or a low on the test it will be denoted as a yes or a no. So whether or not this patient is likely to benefit from endocrine therapy. It also gives us a prognostic score of the risk of recurrence in years five through 10. So let's look at a, a, uh, an example case to just get an idea of what we're really looking at here. So that predictive value for this patient, they were predicted to get benefit from a further five years of endocrine therapy. Their prognostic score was 11.1%. So for this patient, if she was to receive another five years of endocrine therapy, she would reduce that risk from about 11.1% to somewhere about 3.8% based on a 65% relative risk reduction. 
Conversely, this patient was BCI low, so they would not get benefit from a further five years of endocrine therapy, and their risk of recurrence is 2.2% in years five through 10. Regardless of what this patient did, that five to 10 year risk of recurrence would not change uh, in response to additional endocrine therapy. That 65% relative risk reduction is fairly specific, um, and that comes from the proof of concept study in Stockholm, but that was also seen in MA17, Transatom, Ideal, and B42 as well. So there's a little bit of variation in between these, but they all kind of center around the 65% risk reduction, which is what I quote to patients. That prognostic score was also validated, validated in several trials, both in node negative patients as well as node positive patients. Uh, they can have up to three lymph nodes positive. Now, we already discussed that clinical pathologic features are insufficient to predict benefit from extended endocrine therapy. This was illustrated in the IDEAL study in which BCI identified patients that had high-risk clinical features but got no benefit from that full 10 years of endocrine therapy. It also identified low-risk clinical features uh, with patients who ex experienced significant benefit from that additional five years of therapy. We've also seen that quantitative ER and PR staining does not show a significant correlation with the benefit from further endocrine therapy. Only that BCI HI biomarker actually shows a meaningful correlation with uh, extended endocrine therapy benefit. So because of this, BCI is now recognized by NCCN and ASCO guidelines to guide uh, decision-making regarding extended endocrine therapy. Uh, this is the NCCN guidelines for gene expression assays for breast cancers, um, ER positive breast cancers and determination of their adjuvant systemic therapy. You'll notice there are two tests which do have predictive value in this setting and that is the oncotype which helps predict the likelihood that they would benefit from chemo and then also the BCI which helps uh, predict whether they would benefit from another five years of endocrine therapy. These tests are great complements to each other. Uh, they are certainly not uh, meant to replace each other. Um, and BCI is a, a great test after Oncotype because it also helps uh, prognosticate a patient's risk in years five through 10. So we've talked about data, let's talk about patients. Uh, so we've already discussed that patients really struggle with side effects with these medications a lot of the time. So if we're going from five years of therapy to now 10 years of therapy, it's even longer for them to de uh, develop issues as well as adverse events. Uh, it's estimated that 40% of patients are non-compliant with their extended endocrine therapy and obviously poor uh, compliance <laughs> affects the outcomes negatively. These patients don't do quite as well if they don't take their medication. Uh, it's obvious that these side effects can be a big reason for these patients to discontinue uh, the medications, but I want to just call out this 22% here in the gray box that 22% uh, of these patients weren't even sure if their medication was helping them. Uh, in a Yale decision impact study on patients, it showed that 82% of patients studied that were recommended for extended endocrine therapy stated that they would be more likely to be compliant based on BCI results. And that's really significant. It also showed that the BCI results changed physician treatment recommendations regarding that extra five years in 30% of patients, which stated another way that means that almost a third of patients would have been either, either over-treated or under-treated uh, regarding extended endocrine therapy. This is a little bit of a busy slide, and we'll talk more about who's uh, clinically indicated in this uh, for this test, uh, but I do want to talk about the decision uh, marked around year four here. I typically order BCI around year four. The way that I like to do it in my practice is for my patients who are already on a six-month schedule and their fourth year of endocrine therapy, I will mention that there is a tiebreaker test that we would consider doing coming up on year five to determine whether or not they would benefit from another five years of endocrine therapy. When I come back for their next six month follow-up, we would talk about it a little bit more in depth that this test would help them make the determination from whether or not they would get benefit or not from that additional five years. And then it would give us a risk of recurrence in years five through 10. If they were likely to benefit from endocrine therapy, it would reduce that risk by 65%. If they're not likely to benefit, it wouldn't do anything to that risk. So these are the patients that you can 
order BCIN, it is indicated in both pre and post menopausal patients. They can have uh, up to three positive lymph nodes or be lymph node negative. You can use it in T1 through T3 size tumors, uh, grade one through three. You can actually use this in HER2 positive patients as well as HER2 negative, as long as they are ER, ER or PR positive. They can have received chemotherapy as their uh, original adjuvant treatment, but it is important that you send an untreated specimen for testing. Obviously we wanna be uh, running this test on patients who are not already metastatic, and it can be tested on ductal or lob, uh, lobular histologies. So to help kind of put this in perspective of practice, I've put some cases together. These are my own patients with their actual results that we've talked about in our clinic. Case number one was 62 years old at time of diagnosis with an infiltrating lobular carcinoma, T1C N0, grade two ERPR positive, HER2 negative. She had an oncotype recurrent score of 22 and received letrozole alone. She tolerated that with mild hot flashes and joint pain and was able to tolerate it quite well. We ordered BCI around five years after her diagnosis coming into that fifth year of endocrine therapy. And it resulted with uh, and no, in terms of her likelihood to benefit from that additional five years of therapy, her risk of recurrence in years five through 10 was 2.6%. This patient is now off of her endocrine therapy and on annual follow-up. Uh, this is the dream scenario, obviously, that we get to move out to annual follow-up and uh, not be on any more medications, but let's talk about somebody who would get benefit from further therapy. Case number two is 70 years old at diagnosis. She had an infiltrating ductal carcinoma, a T1C N0, grade one ERPR positive, HER2 negative. She was treated with AI alone. She initially was started on anastrozole, which she developed significant joint pain with. She was changed to letrozole, which she has tolerated well. She unfortunately did uh, develop osteoporosis uh, during her endocrine therapy course and was started on denosumab for this. It was around that time that we decided to go ahead and send a BCI to determine our best next steps in terms of her therapy. So this patient is likely to benefit from that extra five years of endocrine therapy. Her uh, risk of recurrence in years five through 10 was 5.7%. And if she took that extra five years of therapy, that risk reduces to about 2%. Uh, this patient continues on letrozole and denosumab with good tolerance and is planned to continue until year 10. So those were fairly low risks of recurrence. So we'll look at people with a little higher risk. Uh, our third patient was 53 years old at time of diagnosis. She had an infiltrating ductal carcinoma, T1C, N1A, so a node positive patient, grade three tumor, ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative. She received adjuvant dose dense ACT followed by an AI. She was originally started on anastrozole, but developed significant joint pain with this. So we changed her to letrozole. This patient, unfortunately, struggled with multiple comorbidities uh, from the time that we met her at her diagnosis. Uh, she had a DVT, has had issues with chronic pain, which was then exacerbated by the AIs. Uh, she's also had renal insufficiency, so she can't take NSAIDs uh, quite as readily as some of our other patients. And then she ended up having a stroke, which necessitated a four-year uh, holiday or four-year, a four-month holiday from her uh, endocrine therapy. And before we ordered this test, she actually asked me, how much longer do I have to take this medicine? Um, so we were rounding the corner into her sixth year of endocrine therapy and her, sorry, into her fifth year of endocrine therapy and her BCI showed that she would not benefit from any further endocrine therapy past that five years. Her risk of recurrence is 11.9% in years five through 10, which makes sense. She is a lymph node positive patient, um, but further therapy would not do anything for this patient other than give her more side effects when she's already having a lot of medical issues. This patient is... Uh, slated to come in next month uh, as she's finishing up that extra four months that she missed when she had her stroke. And she will discontinue endocrine therapy at that time. Our fourth and final patient was 67 years old at time of diagnosis. She had an infiltrating ductal carcinoma, which was T2 and N0. It was ERPR positive as well as HER2 positive. So she received adjuvant paclitaxel and trastuzumab with maintenance trastuzumab. She came to us with significant baseline arthritis and obviously struggled to tolerate endocrine therapy because of this. She was tried on anastrozole and then exemestane and ultimately changed to tamoxifen due to the joint symptoms. 
Unfortunately, she developed steatohepatitis hepatitis with cirrhosis while she was taking tamoxifen, and she elected to discontinue after four and a half years of endocrine therapy uh, for concern for her liver. About a year and a half after we discontinued that endocrine therapy, I was seeing her in routine follow-up, and she asked, how important is it for me to be on endocrine therapy? So we ordered a BCI to see, really, what's it worth to you? Uh, she actually would get benefit from being on it for the full 10 years. Her risk of recurrence was 15.6%, which is one of the higher risks that I've seen. Uh, if she was to go ahead and take that full 10 years of endocrine therapy, her risk would be reduced to 5.5%. This patient actually elected not to continue with endocrine therapy. She stated that that 15% was fairly close to what she was quoted for her HER2 positivity in the beginning. And for her, the risk of side effects did not outweigh the benefits of, uh, sorry, for her, the risk of side effects outweighed the benefits of uh, continuing on endocrine therapy. And I think that really demonstrates the utility of the BCI, that you can give your patients the right information to make the best choice for them so they can take an active role in their care. Thank you for listening and let me know if you have any questions.